Wagner on the Gospel of John Narrated by Timothy Turner Chapter 22 The King Before the Judgment Bar This chapter is based upon John chapter 18, verses 28 to 40. A careful study of all the lessons set forth in this portion of Scripture would require many articles. We must therefore ask the reader carefully to study the text indicated, and will content ourselves with a few leading thoughts. All through his earthly career, Jesus exercised royal authority and showed himself to be a king. On a few occasions he was greeted as king, as for instance by Nathanael, and by the multitude when he rode into Jerusalem. John chapter 12 verse 13 But this occasion was the only time when he declared himself plainly to be king. When Pilate asked him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest it because I am a king. John chapter 18 verse 37, revised version margin. And then in saying, My kingdom is not of this world, he plainly declared his kingship. Jesus was accused to Pilate as a plotter against the Roman government and dangerous to its peace. When Pilate sought to release him, the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. But Jesus destroyed the force of this accusation by declaring his kingdom not to be of this world, and stating that since it was not of this world, his servants would not fight. In delivering Jesus up to Pilate, the Jewish rulers made it very apparent that they had no real accusation against him. When Pilate said, What accusation bring ye against this man? They answered and said unto him, If he were not a male factor, we would not have delivered him up unto thee. This is the same as though a man should be brought before a court, and when the judge asks what charges there are against him, his accusers content themselves by saying, He is a bad man. In so saying, the Jews virtually confessed that they knew nothing against him, and that Pilate must himself find out the character of Jesus by examining him. But Pilate, on examining Jesus, said, I find no fault in him. And Jesus expressly disclaimed any design against the power of the Roman government. Verses 36 and 37 define the character of Christ's kingdom and of his subjects. He is a king, but his kingdom is not of this world. In declaring to Pilate that he was king, he said, To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. He is king of truth, because he is the truth, and therefore truly a king. For since the king is the one who is above all, whosoever is the truth must be a king, because the truth is that which is highest, and which rises above all no matter how much it is downtrodden. Truth, crushed to the earth, will rise again. The eternal years of God are hers. The truth is that which is, that which abides forever. God is the truth. Truth cannot be destroyed. The world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. 1 John chapter 2, verse 17. These facts, taken together with the statement of Christ, prove that this world and the truth are in opposition. And that is shown in the very fact that Christ was on trial. It was the world against the truth, but the world passes away, while truth cannot pass away. Therefore we find that the world is always in opposition to the truth, and thus always in opposition to Christ. The world crucifies Christ today, even as he was crucified from the foundation of the world. And it is by the cross of Christ that we are crucified unto the world and the world unto us. Galatians chapter 6 verse 14 Christ is the Prince of Peace. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 He himself is peace. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 14 He came and preached peace. Verse 17 he rules by peace, Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. It is by the peace of God which passeth all understanding that Christ keeps his subjects, Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. When talking to his disciples the very night he was betrayed, he said, 
These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. John chapter 16 verse 33 All followers of Christ, therefore, have peace and keep the peace, no matter how much war and trouble there may be in the world. Jesus conquered the world not by war, but by peace, and only those who absolutely refuse to fight can conquer the world. When Christ's professed followers take up carnal weapons, they may be put to flight. Indeed, the very taking of weapons is their defeat. But it is absolutely impossible to conquer the man who steadfastly and consistently and for Christ's sake refuses to fight. So long as he maintains his steadfastness, he is a conqueror. Christ says that if his kingdom were of this world, his servants would fight. But he himself had only a few hours before sharply reproved Peter for drawing the sword and had healed the wound made by it. Wherever, therefore, anyone makes use of weapons of warfare, he shows either that he does not understand the nature of Christ's kingdom or that he does not rank himself among Christ's followers. Whoever fights shows himself the servant of another master than Christ, and no man can serve two masters. Christ's kingdom is not of this world. It is of an entirely different nature from the world, and the world is opposed to it, and to Christ and to his followers. Jesus said, If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. John chapter 15 verses 18 and 19. This shows plainly that the world is opposed to and hates Christ's kingdom, because it is not of this world. Therefore it follows that it is impossible for men to be subjects of worldly kingdoms and at the same time subjects of Christ's kingdom. The followers of Christ and the subjects of His kingdom have of right nothing more to do with the government of this world than the subjects of the Tsar of Russia have to do with the government of Great Britain. Someone without thinking might declare this to be anarchy, but that would be only because they do not consider the nature of Christ's kingdom. Christ himself was condemned as an anarchist because the princes of this world did not understand. If they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8 Christ's followers can never be anarchists because the law of God is in their hearts. They represented the highest type of obedience to the law. They are perfect keepers of the perfect law. Moreover, although they do not reckon themselves as subject of this world, they are indeed the very best subjects, since they make no trouble and raise no disturbance. They are keepers of the peace, so much so that instead of resisting unjust law, they will even submit to the most unjust laws without opposition. The just are condemned and killed, but do not resist. James chapter 5, verse 6 Therefore the best subjects that an earthly king can have are those who profess to be and are only subjects of Christ and not of the world. Earthly governments, however, do not as a general thing know this, and so the men whose presence tends to the strength and stability of the government are discriminated against and persecuted. The kingdom of Jesus is not of this world, but outlasts this world. Being of the truth, it is an everlasting dominion. Christ is set at the right hand of God in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 20 and 21. But this place was of right his, even while he was here upon earth. For when talking with Nicodemus, he declared himself to be in heaven. John chapter 3, verse 13. The king of the universe was on trial before an earthly court and an earthly judge, and on trial as to his right to rule. He showed his right to rule there, as everywhere, by bearing witness to the truth. But even as Jesus is set at the right hand of God in heavenly places, 
far above all principalities, power, might, and dominion. So has God raised all those who believe in Him, and made them sit together with Christ in heavenly places. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 6. He loved us, and washed us from our sins in His own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and His Father. Revelation chapter 1 verses 5 and 6. Therefore, All Christ's subjects are kings, far higher in rank than any or all kings of this earth. Power is given them over the nations, the same as to Christ himself. See Psalm chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, and Revelation chapter 2, verses 26 and 27. All are called to be witnesses together with Christ. God says, Ye are my witnesses, and my servant whom I have chosen. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 10. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, an holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 Just as Christ the King was arraigned before the bar, so are all his followers on trial in this world. The court is continually set, the case is always on, and the witnesses are always under oath. If they are faithful and true witnesses, like the Master, then are they kings indeed, and are never overcome, even though condemned, by the peaceful power of simple steadfastness to truth. The followers of Christ will yet be acknowledged, even by the world, to have power greater than that of the world. Yet will they be like Christ, reckoned among the transgressors, For the sad fact is that judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off. For truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. Isaiah chapter 59 verses 14 and 15. Nevertheless, although the truth may be scoffed at as impractical, and its adherents mocked and persecuted, and even put to death, an error will seem to triumph. Yet will the truth rise above everything, even as Christ, although mocked, put to death as a malefactor, and counted as nothing, arose and took his seat on the throne of God. And at no time has he ever been greater than he was when his life was traded for that of a murderer. His humiliation and shame was his glory. His weakness was his strength and the curse of the cross was the means by which he was raised to heaven to bless the universe. May 18, 1899